Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis, lawmg.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you. Coming up on Indiana News Desk. Cases and hospitalizations from COVID-19 are at levels not seen since January, and that has officials concerned as the holidays approach. No matter what I say, no matter what anybody says on TV, um, people are going to gather. Unvaccinated people are going to gather. Vaccinated people are going to gather. They're going to intermingle. Ahead, we talk with an expert about the latest numbers and the Omicron variant. Farmers haven't been immune to supply chain issues and inflation. Right now, we don't have anything. You know, we're out. In 60 more days, we got to have that lot full again. Is it possible? I don't know. I hope so. While the cost of equipment has surged, you might be surprised to learn that demand remains sky high. And what Bloomington's plan to cover 85% of the city with fiber optic cable means for you. Those stories, plus the latest news headlines, right now on Indiana News Desk. Welcome to Indiana News Desk, I'm Joe Wren. The Omicron variant of COVID-19 has not yet been detected in Indiana, but the Delta strain is causing yet another surge of cases and hospitalizations in the state. Brock Turner has this report. COVID-19 hospitalizations this week reached levels not seen since January when vaccines were in extremely limited supply. The virus is more contagious. Delta variant is fueling the surge that pushed the number of Hoosiers hospitalized with the virus past 2,700. More than 95% of the state's new cases are caused by the Delta variant. 80 new deaths from the virus were reported on Wednesday alone. While the vast majority of those hospitalized remain unvaccinated, there's a growing concern a high number of cases could fuel even more infections as the holiday season approaches. Dr. Josh Cullison, the medical director for rural health clinics at Greene County General Hospital, encourages those who remain unvaccinated to reevaluate their plans. No matter what I say, no matter what anybody says on TV, um, people are going to gather. Unvaccinated people are going to gather. Vaccinated people are going to gather. They're going to intermingle. Cullison says he has skipped family functions with large numbers of people who choose not to be vaccinated. So that's not my place to, to tell you to cancel your holiday plans. That's not what I'm trying to do. Um, I just want you to understand the risk. Numerous health officials echo Cullison's concern. Many admit they're burnt out. After months of widely available vaccines, nearly half of eligible Hoosiers remain unvaccinated. Plus, with the high number of current cases and increased holiday travel, officials fear this surge could rival last year's. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. We're joined now by Brian Dixon, the Director of Public Health Informatics at the Regan Street Institute in Indianapolis. Hello, Brian. Thanks so much for joining us. Now, it's been about a week since the first case of the Omicron variant was found in the U.S. What do we know about it now that we didn't then? Well, early data suggests the virus is more transmissible, meaning that it's spreading more quickly than earlier variants, including the Delta variant, which is uh, plaguing us here in Indiana. Um, however, it remains kind of too early to conclude whether the vir virus is uh, more virulent, meaning that it can cause more severe disease uh, than the other variants. So many of the patients in some of the early countries uh, are under 50 years of age, which we would not expect anyway to be in the hospital. So more studies are needed there. Mm. Now, there's been some studies that show the Pfizer vaccine's efficacy drops fairly significantly against Omicron. Will a booster help with that? A booster may be helpful in neutralizing Omicron. It's important to note that these early studies looked 
uh, primarily at protection against infection, not severe outcomes and hospitalization. In studies that we've done, um, we've seen that the vaccines continue to perform very well against Delta and the other variants. So we would expect that the vaccines give you protection against Omicron as well when it comes to the severe consequences of COVID. Um, that said, our studies also show that effectiveness drops over time. So it's important to uh, get a booster, especially if you're uh, if you have an immunocompromised condition or risk factors like hypertension or diabetes, or uh, older adults also are more vulnerable to uh, coronavirus. I see a lot of people wondering too which booster to get. Does that matter? Um, it doesn't matter. I think most of our studies show that the mRNA vaccines, so that would be the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, um, have slightly higher efficacy than or effectiveness than um, than the Johnson and Johnson vaccine. So I think that uh, any of the vaccines will give you some protection. But uh, if it were my loved ones, I'd probably recommend they either get the Pfizer or Moderna booster. Hospitalizations, reaching numbers not seen since last winter. Is there a way to tell how long the surge could last? Uh, it's it's hard to tell how long it will last. Uh, these trends, though, are very similar to what we saw last winter, so we should anticipate high levels of hospitalization through January. At that time, we, we think that the hospitalizations will begin to recede. Uh, the caveat, of course, is Omicron. So when it reaches Indiana and begins to spread rapidly, it may boost numbers even higher um, because people more people will become infected. Um, so I would anticipate hospitalization rates uh, all all things equal to start coming down in the spring. That's the pattern that appears to be uh, consistent with other coronaviruses. All right, Brian, thanks so much for being with us today. Really appreciate it. Thank you for inviting me. Well, many employees are turning to religious ex exemptions as vaccine mandates become more common in workplaces. Exemptions are federally protected under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. But what is the history of these exemptions and what are the consequences? Indiana Public Broadcasting's Lauren Chapman reports. Imam Ahmed Alamin frequently speaks to his mosque in Indianapolis about getting vaccinated. In fact, he's trying to set up a clinic at the mosque to make it easier to do so. For him, getting people vaccinated is just as much about faith as it is personal. He had COVID-19 in April 2020. I, my experience with malaria was horrible, mm -hmm. but COVID was worse. Um, I never thought every day that passed by or night, I would just assume that would be my last day or night. A handful of vaccines, some MMR, shingles, and nasal flu vaccines, use PIC technology, specifically porcine gelatin, as a stabilizer. That goes against dietary restrictions for some Jews and Muslims, which are a common reason for religious vaccine exemptions. Alamin says the Quran makes an exception for medicine. Islam does allow to use something that is normally forbidden, use it as a medication. It is going to be an accepted way to treat as long as it helps saving somebody's life. None of the COVID-19 vaccines available in the U.S. use porcine gelatin. Alamin says he doesn't support Muslims using religious exemptions for vaccine mandates. With more people pushing for broader exemptions, he says all faith traditions should encourage vaccines. We have to use the faith to save people's lives. We should not use faith to, to destruct humanity, to, to, to cause harm to humanity. Um, if you don't want to take vaccine, that's your choice. But please do not use faith as a weapon. There's a long history of protecting religious expression in the U.S. Religious exemptions are federally protected under the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Rachel Oliveri, law professor at the University of Missouri, says these are in a section called Title VII, which specifically addresses employment discrimination. It also includes reasonable accommodations for sincerely held religious beliefs. The courts are very reluctant to intrude too deeply on what a person's sincerely held religious beliefs are. So it doesn't have to be something that comes from a mainstream faith tradition. Um, it can be a much more personalized belief system. Um, you know, we, what we really wouldn't want is courts sort of deciding what counts as religion and what doesn't. And so courts have given wide berth to religious beliefs, with a few caveats. Title VII says employers do not need to make accommodations that create an undue burden. 
That's where Oliveri says the limitations lie for religious exemptions for COVID-19 vaccine mandates. But what's very clear um, when it comes to the Title VII mandates is that the religious exemption is, is not a giant loophole you can just walk through. And there's a reason for that. Exemptions can have real consequences. Dr. Saad Omer is director of the Yale Institute for Global Health and an epidemiologist. He says with any non-medical exemption to vaccines, it requires a Goldilocks approach. If exemptions are too hard to obtain, Omer says research shows people will find other ways to navigate around mandates. And if they are freely available, we know that they tend to cluster uh, and they can contribute to, we have shown for, uh, against multiple diseases now, that they can uh, impact um, the local epidemiology of disease and can be associated with outbreaks. Those clusters have consequences for unvaccinated and vaccinated members of the community. In a good year, flu vaccines hit about a 40 percent efficacy. The mRNA COVID-19 vaccines boasted about a 90 percent efficacy, but no vaccine is 100 percent. So that increases everyone's risk. And so, so there are consequences for folks. Throughout the pandemic, Imam Ahmed Alamin invited epidemiologists and other health experts to talk to his mosque about social distancing and vaccines. In fact, he calls efforts to get people vaccinated a jihad. When people hear the term jihad, the only thing they know about is the extreme violence. Uh, but jihad simply means a struggle and resistance. And uh, this is our jihad. It's our resistance against an enemy for humanity, um, uh, uh, a virus that claimed the life of uh, uh, hundreds of thousands around the world. For Indiana Public Broadcasting, I'm Lauren Chapman. U.S. Senator Mike Braun says he doesn't support government mandates around the COVID-19 vaccine, including efforts to stop companies from requiring it. Braun is currently leading a bipartisan fight in Congress to halt President Biden's rule that would force companies with at least 100 employees to either get their workers vaccinated or undergo weekly COVID-19 testing. But Braun does not support measures that would prevent companies from requiring the vaccine on their own. The Indiana State House Republicans are currently pushing a bill that would effectively do just that. I'm a little apprehensive on that happening simply because of what it might mean to where you try to impact businesses in their own decisions uh, on other issues down the road. The precedent might set. Braun encouraged people to get the vaccine, calling it a miracle. Coming up next on Indiana News Desk. Supply issues and inflation are making it difficult for farmers to find and afford new and used equipment for their fields. And Bloomington has plans to cover much of the city with fiber optic cable. Ahead, what that means for you. These stories and more right here on Indiana News Desk. Wake up. Wake up to the world. To the marvels. The mayhem. The music. Wake up to the wows. The woes. The wonder. Wake up to the commotion. To the beauty. To the humanity. To the hope. Wake up every morning, fully awake. NPR Morning Edition. Tune in to your local station <laughs> or download the NPR app. Year after year, PBS has been bringing you the news you trust. We care about the things that are going to affect the lives of each and every American. The in-depth analysis you need. What we normally see in these big crises. And the true stories that have to be told. We're a place that people can come not just to find out what happened, but why it matters. It's all thanks to the support of viewers like you. Thank you, and stay tuned to America's most trusted network. <laughs> Welcome back to Indiana News Desk. WTIU News has received body camera footage from Indianapolis police of Vox Booker's arrest earlier this year. The incident occurred outside of an Indianapolis bar and grill after what Booker described as another racial incident. Mitch Legan reports. They, they literally call me a boy. Former Bloomington activist Vox Booker was arrested in September for allegedly shoving a police officer. It happened after Indianapolis Metropolitan Police responded to a disturbance call at downtown Ollie's. They were met by Booker, who was complaining that Ollie's staff was intoxicated, being aggressive, and yelling rude and racist comments at him. 
not acceptable to me, not acceptable to Ollie's. It is not acceptable, period. And I apologize to you that that happened. In one body cam video, Officer Alan Hopkins speaks with Booker about the incident and tells him he's unable to arrest people for saying things. Who is the bartender? Do you know his name? I told you. Did you he's you don't the get district to tell officer. You he's will, the district you officer. Me. Bye bye. Booker follows Hopkins, asking for his ID back. Get on the sidewalk. He has my ID. Get on the sidewalk. Thank you. Don't, don't, don't push me. on me. Did you really just push me? You pushed me first. Three officers were present at the scene, but only one body cam video shows the confrontation between Booker and Hopkins. Booker was charged with battery against a public safety official, a level six felony. He has a pretrial hearing scheduled for February 1st. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Mitch Legan. In a separate case, Booker intends to re-enter the restorative justice process regarding an incident at Lake Monroe last summer. The agreement filed in Monroe Circuit Court this week says if Booker completes the process, charges against him will be dropped. Booker said he was nearly lynched by a group of white men as he was celebrating the 4th of July at the lake. Two of his alleged attackers were also charged. The two sides agreed to try to settle the issue using restorative justice, but Booker withdrew from the process in August. Inflation and challenges with the global supply chain are pushing the price of just about everything higher. For farmers, the situation is even more complicated. Brock Turner has more on what's causing some used tractors to sell for more than what they cost when new. Brock Kiesler is no stranger to equipment auctions. So, Mr. Doctor, what's that number, 8,000? Kiesler is here looking for a new combine and a head unit for harvesting next year's crop. He's young and trying to get his start in agriculture, so purchasing new equipment is out of the question. Starting out, you know, I, I don't have the capital the big boys have. I don't have the access to banks. Banks won't hardly lend me any money on used equipment and things, so it's pretty much a cash and carry basis, so it very much limits your growth. Even if he could access the credit, Kiesler would likely have a hard time finding something before next spring. We really believe 2023 is what is what we're forecasting. There's some models we order now, and it's not Kubota's fault, but you, you know you could select when you'd like it delivered, and a lot of those models are coming up June. 2023, February 2023. McClure and others say problems acquiring steel and computer chips for larger models make it even harder to provide the type of service they're accustomed to. We're probably 25 units behind right now. So by the time we get caught up, you know, we're probably going to be halfway through 2022 and we're in the same boat again. McClure says many of the tractors on his lot are already sold and awaiting final accessories before they can be shipped to their new owners. While these types of supply chain challenges affect everything from your morning cup of coffee to your car, the situation is unique for farmers. Many purchased seed, fertilizer, and other inputs well before today's challenges. That, paired with a strong harvest this year, means many farmers are sitting on larger than normal profits. Buyers and experts alike say the price of used farm equipment at auction can be up to 30% higher. One, two, two, three, now three, four, Farmers have disposable income, so they have money to spend. Tax laws really, really favor purchasing equipment. If you look, look at it, most farmers write off their equipment using uh, at Section 179 expensing and pretty fast depreciation rates pretty quickly. So if they, if they want to shelter any of this, this 2021 income, um, they need to do it with the capital purchases. Schnitke also studies the price of new equipment. Those prices are up to at least 8%, but more for other types. He says it's all a function of supply and demand. Part of that is supply problems with with the, the the same the chip manufacturing chip shortages that we saw so there's those issues and then there's just labor issues which is impacting everybody Kiesler has attended equipment auctions for years but this is the first time he's gone with the hope of driving home one of these combines but the higher prices were beyond his budget a year ago it was probably 30% less than it is now. 
Um, but just due to the farming economy currently, and it seems like everybody's got plenty of money, um, if you find a really cherry piece of used equipment, things are bringing top dollar, almost as much or more than it when they were bought new. While nearly everyone agrees this isn't sustainable long term, currently the market is showing few signs of cooling. Kurt Everett is a buyer at one of Indiana's largest farm equipment auctions. Right now we don't have anything. You know, we're out. In 60 more days we got to have that lot full again. Is it possible? I don't know. I hope so. I mean, we, we always say it's not going to be and we've always made it, but it's getting tougher. I will tell you that. Many farmers already see the end of this boom and profits coming. Inputs like seed and fertilizer cost two to three times more than last year. But right now, in the short run, many see dollar signs. The price of corn is up 75% since March. When guys start seeing that return on investment for corn, even in the used market, everybody now thinks they want to be a big-time farmer and make a little money. Everett worries about what could happen when the market does slow. We're way out here on the limb. Just waiting on that thing to break off, and I hope I don't have a bunch of inventory when it does break. <laughs> Nearly everyone interviewed agrees this isn't sustainable. Do you think a lot of farmers are overpaying for stuff now? Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And I'm overpaying for stuff, you know? Everything's way out of touch. Way out of touch. Will it come back? I don't know. I kind of like for it to go back the way it was, you know, but who knows. In the meantime, Everett says he'll continue scouring dealerships across Indiana and neighboring states to put auctions together, a task that's becoming increasingly difficult. Keesler isn't losing hope either. He's going to resist overpaying, but insists he'll continue looking. Otherwise, he'll have to tinker with his current combine to ensure it's ready for harvest next year. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Brock Turner. Last month, the city of Bloomington announced plans to build a fiber network to bring high-speed internet to at least 85% of residences with global investor Meridium. No formal agreement has been signed, but the plan will boost digital equity. Holden Absher reports. Most internet service providers build the infrastructure they use to provide internet access to individual homes. This can result in companies selectively laying fiber in high income or dense areas. Bloomington is solving the problem by making internet more accessible with an open access model. This means a third party company will lay digital fiber throughout most of the city and local internet service providers will lease the space. One of the difficulties of of uh, internet service providers uh, at the same time being the infrastructure providers is that there is a conflict of interest between the uh, content you provide and the interest you have in the infrastructure. Meridium is the global infrastructure investor Bloomington signed a letter of intent with back in November to build the $40 million broadband network. Rubio says the company's experience in the financial and industrial industries both combined to make a unique business strategy. Design the strategy of investing in projects that make sense, that solve actual social problems, that, that are helping the society. It's difficult to be successful when you are a long-term investor if you're not solving true problems. This will be Meridium's second broadband project in North America, but the first in the United States. The company plans to continue investing in similar projects given the recent impact of COVID-19. Learning from home and working from home requires good internet access. And not having that good internet access creates uh, inequality between individuals and also between municipalities. Before opening the network to multiple internet service providers such as AT&T and Comcast, Meridian will enter into a contract with only one initial provider for an undisclosed period of time. Many of us have AT&T and Comcast uh, home speeds, which may be 25 megabytes up and down, uh, maybe five, maybe 50, maybe 75 megabytes up and down. Um, uh, Digital fiber lets you get a thousand megabytes up and down. Meridium says it extended the date of its final agreement with Bloomington until January 31st to better develop outreach to low income areas. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Holden Apsher. And you may have a hard time finding a Christmas tree this year or paying more for it. Nicole Kimbo reports that's due to climate and shipping issues. 
Twin H Tree Farm president Gene Hopwood says the climate change and droughts have been taking a toll on the industry. If you have two years of drought in a row, you're going to lose two years of planting, plus you're some trees in your three and four year old fields. So that leaves a big gap. Hopwood says growing the most popular Christmas tree, Fraser firs, has been difficult to grow in Indiana due to warm weather. Other types of spruce trees have fungus that can be hard to control. It's like if you cut a rose and you want to use it a month from now, you can imagine what it's going to look like. If it's just the trees can't hold that moisture that long. Trees have to come from parts of the country that have stable weather conditions, making it expensive for farmers to get them shipped and driving selling prices up. Christmas trees take seven to nine years to grow, keeping farmers busy months before the holiday season starts. People think that uh, we only work at Christmas, but we're working all year long. You have to trim every tree every year. Uh, you have to keep it mowed to keep the disease and the fungus down. Hopwood says it will take several years to dig out of this shortage. For Indiana News Desk, I'm Nicole Kimbo. Our work continues online at WTIUnews.org. Have a great weekend. Indiana News Desk is made possible in part by Smithville, Fiber Internet, Streaming TV, Home Security and Automation in Southern Indiana. More information at smithville.com. Maller Grodner Attorneys, providing legal services to clients and the community. Understanding, expertise, results. Bloomington and Indianapolis. LawMG.com. IU Alumni Association, connecting IU's network of alumni and sharing the Indiana spirit through scholarships, advocacy, and volunteerism. Alumni.iu.edu. IU Center for Rural Engagement, extending IU Bloomington resources to improve Hoosier lives in partnership with communities and organizations. Rural.indiana.edu. And by WTIU members. Thank you.